I'd like to take a moment to thank my mom for listening to every episode. Now, my mom is the real reason you're listening to this show right now, but the sponsors have a little something to do with it as well. So I'd like to thank our sponsors too. Clio, Noda, Scorpion, TimeSolve. Built for lawyers, Noda's cloud-based business banking is perfect for your solo or small law firm. You want to spend your day helping clients, not struggling to reconcile bank statements. Noda's customer service specialists are here to help you. They only support attorneys so they understand the tools you use and the requirements you're up against, and they take your business as seriously as you do. Don't miss out on exciting new member benefits, including our partnership with Lawline to earn ethics credits for your CLEs. Online at trustnoda.com slash legal. Noda, banking built for law firms like yours. Terms and conditions may apply. It's the Legal Toolkit with Jared Korea. With guest Jeff Lance, a round of Lance a lot. And in our ongoing effort to get sponsored by Disney Plus, Jared will cosplay as Moon Knight. Not me, though. I always do this show in the nude. But first, your host, Jared Korea. Hello, friends. Gather around. It's Legal Toolkit Podcast time again. And yes, it's still called the Legal Toolkit Podcast, even though I've never worked as a night watchman down at Miller Tool and Die. Why? Because there are better places to be. I'm your host, Jared Korea, and you're stuck with me because Guy Smiley was unavailable because he's a fucking puppet. I'm the CEO of Red Cave Law Firm Consulting, a business management consulting service for lawyers and bar associations. Find us online at redcavelegal.com. I'm the CEO of Gideon Software, Inc. We build chatbots so law firms can convert more leads and conversational document assembly tools so law firms can build documents faster and more accurately. You can find out more about Gideon at gideonlegal.com. Now, before we get to our interview today with Jeff Lance, CEO of Esquire Interactive, I want to take a moment to discuss your online presence. In just a few minutes, we're going to chat with my boy Jeff Lance about website design and web presence. He talks about that subject matter in an entirely unique way, and I think you'll enjoy what he has to say. Nay, I know you will. But I want to take a moment to set the table for my friend Jeff. I talk to a lot of law firms about SEO. That's search engine optimization, in case you didn't know. And it's also referred to as SEM, search engine marketing, in a broader context. And they kind of tend to view it, lawyers do, as some sort of mystery box. Like, what is SEO? It's like watching Lost, wondering what might happen next. What happens when they finally open the hatch? Will anyone find my website online? Well, I sure fucking hope so, because what are we doing here if not? This is a subset of the law firm in a box problem that is very real in the legal field. That's when the law firm owner says, hey, is there a template you can give me? Or can you just do it for me? Now, as I've mentioned on this podcast before, I'm an advocate of law firms using vendors to perform non-legal tasks. Delegation is real, and it's spectacular. However, that doesn't mean you just drop whatever bundle of tasks you have into the solution provider's lap without expressing any level of intellectual curiosity. Let me be clear. There is no law firm in a box, stop asking, and there's no law firm marketing template either. Every law firm is different. So as a law firm owner, your job is to build a plan or to contribute in the building of the plan that a vendor can then execute. And if it's something like a web or digital marketing plan, it's probably the latter. But you must be an active participant in the process to make it work. If you want more great tips related to how digital marketing agencies conduct their business, now you can work with them, check out the Lunch Hour Legal Marketing Podcast on this very network, featuring two proud Ohio State alums, Conrad Sam and Guy Sakalakis. Oh, that's just another dope podcast I created. Ho-hum. Now, I've already done the delegation thing, so I'm not going to rehash that. And now you know you need to be an active participant alongside your vendors. But there are also some simple things you can do, either in association with your vendors or on your own, that can have a positive impact on your lead intake and conversion, and which won't cost you a dime. So here's the play. Most law firms generate a not insignificant amount of referrals, especially solo and small firms. But gone are the halcyon days when a referred lead would just, you know, trust the person sending them along. That Dale Carnegie bullshit is long gone. And like Fox Mulder said, trust no one. There's just too much information out there now, and everybody knows how to use the internet. So yes, each and every referred lead you get 
unless like 100 years old, is going to search for your name or the name of your firm before they hire you. The question is, what will they find? The answer for most lawyers is, damned if I know. Now, even the most tech-averse attorneys know that it's pretty easy to Google your own name or the name of your law firm. So do it and see what comes up. Here's a preview. For most people, it's going to be a combo platter of your website links, social media profiles, and directory profiles, all of which have some level of control over. You have some level of control over those, I should say. These page one links are, of course, the ones that your potential clients are most likely to click. So how do they look? How do you present to a potential client? If the answer is very, very, very poorly, you can fix that. The good news is that you largely have control over most of what's showing up. Again, you can entirely control your website and your social media profiles. So update them or complete them as needed. And with respect to those directory profiles, you can edit and update the free ones and decide whether you want to pay for the higher ranking paid options. Of course, the 800-pound gorilla in this grouping, which is as yet unnamed, like Voldemort. Oh, shit. I actually said his name. Is Google My Business, now known as the Google Business Profile. But I'm going to let Jeff handle that one. So stay tuned. Before we get to that free-flowing conversation about web presence with the singular Jeff Lance of Esquire Interactive, let me direct your attention to Joshua Lennon, who's got you for this week's edition of the Clio Legal Trends Report. Did you know law firms with growing revenue are twice as likely to use financial reporting tools to track their performance? I'm Joshua Lennon, lawyer in residence at Clio, and this is just one finding from our recent Legal Trends Report. Understanding your firm's financial performance helps you make better choices. But unfortunately, 60% of legal professionals are not confident about their knowledge of their firm's revenue. If you can relate, consider adopting reporting tools to track utilization, realization, and collection rates, the three leading metrics to track your firm's revenue. Don't worry, if math isn't your thing, just knowing your firm's numbers is half the battle. For more information on what firms with growing revenue are doing differently, download Clio's Legal Trends Report for free at clio.com forward slash trends. That's Clio spelled C-L-I-O dot com forward slash trends. All right, let's fire up the chimichangas. It's time to interview our guest. My guest today, very excited. Jeff Lance, the CEO of Esquire Interactive. Jeff, how are you, sir? Great, Jared. How are you doing today? I can't complain. A little tired, but we'll pull through. But that's every day for me. Exactly. Now, Jeff, we've been friends for a while, and I just want to publicly apologize because I've never had you on this podcast before, which is shameful. What can I do to make it up for you? Uh, I'll, I'll be sending you an email after the show, Jared. You'll have a nice long <laughs> list. So... <laughs> Good, good. Please do. You are one of the people I often refer out for like website work and SEO and anything like web presence related. So I'm glad you're coming on. So I wanted to talk about a few different concepts with you. Because I think one of the things you do really well is conceptualize this notion of like a web presence for a law firm really well, better than a lot of people I've talked to. So let's start with websites and go from there. So websites, I think, are interesting in terms of like what people actually look at on a site. <laughs> and I think what most attorneys think about websites, they think about it as like this big box that they got to put stuff into. But realistically, if you looked at like a heat map of a site, there are things that people are looking at. There are things that people are ignoring. So firstly, what website pages are important? Like what are people actually looking at when they're looking at a website for a law firm? That's a good question. And typically, you brought up a good concept, heat maps, which show where people are actually looking, which is a lot of times very different than where law firms think people are looking. And typically, where they look at is the homepage, obviously, is going to be a really critical area. And, and they tend yeah. to look at things like, typically, there's a top image on, the, on a website homepage, it's often called the hero image. People typically look there. Then what they do is they scan. So they, the next thing that they'll do after that is they, they'll take a look at like a lot of times the big titles and everything underneath that. So they'll see one big title, and then they'll skip all the text, then they'll go down to the next big title, skip all the text, and then go down to the next big title. Occasionally, if there's pictures, especially pictures of people, 
they'll take a look at that. But a lot mm-hmm. of times what they do is they'll gloss right over all that carefully formulated text <laughs> about the, you know, the 50 reasons on why you should choose our law firm rather than the guys down the street. Right. So like all that time you spent drafting that text, probably not as important as you think. Well, it's actually counterintuitive in a lot of cases, because not only do people not want to often read a lot of that text, it just kind of turns them off. So a lot of people think, um, and lawyers in particular, it's kind of like if you have more room, you know, if you have like a a 20 page brief, you're going to write 20 pages and they take that (laughs) same concept to the homepage and they try to fill up the whole homepage with lots of text they should really understand that it's about images, it's about key messages, and particularly think about white space as being your friend, not your enemy. Yeah, I like that. And I think those websites look better in general. Well, let me ask you this. I think this is an interesting thing you brought up, which is like pictures of people seem to be the way to go, right? Like rather than like stock images or something like that, or is there a combination of those two things that you could use effectively? It's really, I I think a lot of times a combination, but definitely to get pictures of the actual attorneys at the firm. People know that a lot of the stock images, you know, they they see the same guy and the same guy is an attorney, (laughs) a doctor. He's uh, got some medical conditions. They know that those aren't real people. So if you're going to use stock images and particularly stock images of people, there's, there's a lot of images out there that are really good, but they don't look like overly produced. It reminds me of the, you watch The Office? On, oh, used yeah. to watch The Office. You remember yeah. the episode with the chair model? When Michael yeah. Scott fell in love with the chair model? And <laughs> spoiler alert, she turned, the model actually turned out to be dead. But like, <laughs> she was in like all the chair catalogs. <laughs> Similar thing here. I get what you're talking about with stock images. Exactly. So I think that's really helpful because I think a lot of law firms focus on the text rather than the image and the white space and the latter is often more important. So... Broadly speaking, you use this term, have used it for years, which is like, does your website resonate with people? And so I think that's a really clever way to look at websites. So what does that mean? And if a law firm website doesn't resonate, how can you fix it? Yeah. So you don't want to have what I call the leisure suit website. You know, the website that once looked cool a long, long time ago, but now looks extremely dated. (laughs) Just like you wouldn't want to show up in court in a leisure suit today in most in most places, you also don't want a website that looks really outdated. So what looks good today is using a lot of white space, nice, fresh, not too much text. Think about really doing those kind of things, and that's really going to give you the best, the best positive resonation. One of the things that you can do for resonation a lot of times that is completely overlooked is if you haven't done so already, I would highly recommend installing Google Analytics. Mm. And when you go to Google Analytics, you can drill down as much as you want, but there's a lot of very high-level things that you can look at. Probably three things are the average time on site, the average number of pages viewed per session, and a thing called the bounce rate. The bounce rate is the percent of time that a user comes to your website and only sees one page and then leads to go back to presumably someplace else on Google or wherever else they might want to go on the web. Right. And the bounce rate is typically around 50 to 60% is pretty decent for a website, a law firm website. But if you have a bounce rate, the the higher the bounce rate, the worse that it is. So if you have a bounce rate that's like 95%, That means in 95% of the cases, people are leaving your website after only seeing one page. Yeah, that's not great. So you're telling me I should get rid of my leisure suit? Does that include my Nehru jacket as well? Because I'd like to keep that if possible. No, you look look really good in that, Jared. You definitely don't want to get rid of that. I I appreciate that. Lime green, (laughs) not everybody can pull that off. Exactly. So I want to... I want to dive in a little bit deeper to this analytics piece. So just to like, so people know, like Google Analytics is free, right? It's available. You just need to put the plug in on your site. And then it's got a whole host of data that's available to you. So I want to talk a little about this too, because like, I don't think a lot of law firms like focus on this necessarily, but like, there's a key point here in that you want to be aware of the analytics 
the data surrounding your website. And then you actually want to act on it too, right? So once you know whether or not these things are happening for good or ill, you got to make moves in one direction to either fix it up or lean into what you're doing well, right? Like this is data and then data application. Exactly. So basically the way that you can kind of think about it, it's kind of circular. So you do your website, you maybe create some nice blog posts and, and some other content that you think is good. Then, you know, you launch your website and then you look at Google Analytics and try to find out what people, um, how they're using your website. What pages are they seeing? Are they going to a lot of different blog posts that you're writing? If they go to the blog posts, are they staying on? Does it look like they're reading your blog posts and you can tell that by how long they're on the page? Yep. Or do they just get your blog post and leave? And then once you start kind of getting that kind of feedback, then you can use that feedback to create new content and to make other types of changes on your website. And we're talking about like average time, just so people know, because you could look at a page, right? And say, okay, the average time a visitor spends on this blog post is X, which is really helpful data in the aggregate. So in terms of this notion of web presence, which is wider than just the website, which you talk about as well, you kind of refer to this as an integrated marketing platform. So what does that mean and how much more than a website are you building out to get the most bang for your buck in terms of web presence? You really want to think about your website, other key places. One of the key places that people don't really appreciate is Google My Business. Google My Business is great not only because it's the number one place to go to try to get reviews for your firm, which you can then use on your website, which is really critical. But you can also add blog posts or promote blog posts on Google My Business as well, which will actually help your Google My Business listing to show up higher in the search results or to be shown more frequently in what's called the Google 3-pack, which are the three listings in kind of the Maps section. Mm -hmm. So if you think about your platform as being your website, Google My Business, other key social media places like Facebook or LinkedIn, could even be uh, Twitter and a whole host of other places. What we encourage law firms to think about is that is their platform, which is a lot different than thinking about my internet presence is my website. And then just occasionally I might make a post to Facebook or LinkedIn yeah. or something like that. So it's how you use it together. Yeah, Google, my business is completely underutilized. Didn't they, they just changed it to Google Business Profile or something, right? Isn't that the new name for it? Yeah, they're changing it again. I mean, it used to be Google Places, and right, for right. some reason they change it every few years. I don't know why, but just they to like to do people. that. Yeah, it really is. That posting information is really interesting because I, I don't think a lot of people are aware that you can actually make posts to that to expand your profile a little bit. So in terms, of, in terms of this integrated marketing platform, that makes sense to me. Take advantage of Google, right? Build a good website, get onto social media. The question everybody asks is, okay, how do I get to the, to the top of the first page of the Google rankings, right? That's what everybody's advertising for. So how does that approach help firms do that? Like rise in the rankings, be more visible to consumers. Are you asking about the benefit about being the top of the rankings or are you asking about how more about how to do that? Why don't you do both? I think tell me about the benefit and then let's talk about how a marketing platform allows you to do that better than just focusing on a website. Sure. Okay, so the benefit about being in the top of uh, the top of the the rankings on Google is somewhere around 35% of the time and this is across like all Google searches, but about 35% of the time when a user does a search on Google, they will click on one of the, the top three organic listings. Mm. So if you think on a normal Google page, there's and typically- And so people know the organic listings are under the paid listings, right? Exactly. They're under the paid listings, and they're also under the Google My Business listings, which are the ones that are in the Maps box. Right, right, right. So if you just think about the statistics, so like 35% of the time, people are going to click one of the top three organic listings- probably around 50 or 60% of the time, they're going to click someplace on the first page of the search results. So if a link to your law firm website is not showing up on the first page of the search results, you know, at least half of the time, no one's ever going to get to the second page. So they're never going to see your firm. So your firm's not going to be considered. So that's the 
answer to the benefit question. Right. The how-to question is really in-depth for search engine optimization. There's a lot of technical things that you can do on your website around creating alt tags, title tags, a lot of other types of things to get high rankings. But one of the things that is probably underutilized is writing FAQ content. FAQ content or frequently asked question content is basically addressing questions that a lot of potential clients may ask, like, what happens if I die in Massachusetts without a will? Right. You're screwed. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, Jared inherits all your money. So that's what that's, <laughs> yes, I that's wish. the quick no. answer. <laughs> no, go ahead. Keep going. So if you can think about questions like that and not just write like, you know, one paragraph or something like that, but maybe a 1200 word blog post that goes into a lot of detail on that, mm. there's a couple things that will happen. Ideally, Google will display a link to your page at the top of the search results when a user or potential client is searching for that particular question. Right. The other thing that can happen too, when you do, when you write this nice page about, you know, what happens to your state if you die without a, a will, you can also do what's called FAQ schema, mm -hmm. which is code that you can put into your page. And the benefit of doing that is we probably all probably seen when you put a question in Google, sometimes what Google does in addition to just showing links, sometimes they'll show either a short answer directly or they'll show a bunch of questions and like a little box thing under that. And you can click on one of the questions and it'll yep. kind of open up and show more content. Yeah. So those are called Google answer boxes. And if you create that type of content within your blog post, then ideally Google might also take that content itself also with a link to your website and show it in an answer box. Cool. Lots of good tips. As always, I would encourage people to reach out to you if they have questions. Jeff, will you hang around for the next segment? You got time? Absolutely. Okay. We'll take one final sponsor break so you can hear more about what our sponsors can do for your law practice. Then stay tuned for the rump roast. It's even more supple than the roast beast. Imagine billing day being the happiest day of the month instead of the day you dread. Nobody went to law school because they love drafting invoices for clients and chasing overdue bills. At TimeSolve, our attorneys have the tools to achieve a 97% collection rate. That means more revenue for the same work and turning billing day into happy day. Learn more about how to get to your time and billing happy place at TimeSolve.com. Now more than ever, an effective marketing strategy is one of the most important things your law firm can have, and Scorpion can help. With nearly 20 years of experience serving the legal industry, Scorpion has proven methods to help you get the high-value cases you deserve. Join thousands of attorneys across the country who have turned to Scorpion for effective marketing and technology solutions. For a better way to grow your practice, visit scorpionlegal.com. All right, welcome back, everybody. Here we are at the rear end of the legal toolkit, the rump roast. It's a grab bag of short form topics, all of my choosing. Why do I get to pick? Well, because I'm the host. Jeff, welcome back. Thank you, Jared. As I said before, we're friends. Hopefully that's the case after we do this segment. But um, your last name is Lance, which you're probably aware of. Yes. So in honor of your appearance on the Legal Toolkit podcast today, I've created a whole new game just for you. I'm calling it Lance a Lot. Your only job <laughs> is to identify other famous lances throughout history, and we'll see how you do. <laughs> okay. Are you? I think you got this. Are you ready to roll? I'm ready. Now, the clue is Lance a Lot. So keep in mind, Lance. Okay. First question slash statement. This vehicle appearing under the Dodge brand, first appeared in 1955. Your answer, sir. Uh, would that be the Lancer? Yes, yes, correct. You can see the theme I'm going with here. Dodge Lancer, uh, three actually unrelated models of the Dodge Lancer. One in the 50s, one in the 60s, and one in the 80s, which is kind of crazy. 
I didn't know there was ones before the 80s. That's oh, the yeah. only one that I was aware of. So just so the people know, because I know people are going to be interested in this, of course, the second version of the of the Dodge Lancer, which came out in the 60s, was replaced by the Dodge Dart, which people know. And then the third version of the Dodge Lancer was replaced by the Dodge Spirit in 1989. And there was also a car called the Mitsubishi Lancer, which has like a million different offshoots. So super popular name for a car. All right, you're one for one. I'm impressed. You ready for question two? Yes. Who created Woody Woodpecker? Uh, Walter Lance. Oh, man, you're crushing it. Can you confirm for people that I did not feed you answers in advance of this session? He, you did not feed me answers to that. The only reason that I would know that is when I was a kid, sometimes people would ask me if I was related to him. Really? Okay, Walter Lance, American cartoonist, animator, producer, and director, uh, not only created Woody Woodpecker, but had a Walter Lance Productions, which produced a lot of other cartoons as well. You're killing it, man. All right, let's see if I can make these a little bit harder. Question number three. This company is known for its sandwich cracker variety packs, which also made up 70% of my diet from the ages of 8 to 11. What company is this? <laughs> uh, I think it's just called Lance, isn't it? Yes. Like, yes, sir. L-E-N-C-E. Whew, three for three. Lance Snack Company. Did you ever have those, like, snack crackers? They had, like, the orange bread and the peanut butter, and then they had, like, the white bread and the cheese. They have, like, 18 different types of snack crackers. They were delicious. I don't think my mom would let me eat those. Oh, I, yeah, I probably no, eat I'm too just many ki- I'm just kidding. Lance crackers. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally not true. All right, all right. Uh, well, I don't know if your mom listens, but if she's listening, we totally know that you let Jeff eat Lance crackers back in the day. All right, question number, you're three for three. You're, you're guaranteed 500 here. This famous knight is King Arthur's right-hand man. So we're talking about Lancelot? Yes, four for six. That was easy. I, all right, all right, all right. I got two more, and I think these are going to be the toughest ones. So let's see if you can keep your perfect score going. The model for Rosie the Riveter's character, made famous during World War II, was actually named Geraldine Doyle. Where was she from? Uh, I'm going to have to go with Lansing. Yes, Lansing, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is like easy for you. You're smoking. Okay, number six, to retain the perfect score and to win. Nothing. This medical journal is popular in university libraries. The last time I saw it, it was on microfiche, if folks remember that. Uh, the Lancet? Yes. Oh, man. Wow. Sorry, that's the sound of one hand clapping, but very impressive, sir. <laughs> the Lancet is a weekly peer-reviewed general medical journal. It's among the world's oldest and best-known general medical journals. It was founded in 1823 by wow. Thomas Wakeley. Yes, an English surgeon who named it after the surgical instrument called the Lancet. Jeff, very impressive. You know your lances. You've done do. your name proud. Thank you very much. I don't know what more we could do here. So I guess it's time for me to say, very impressed. This may have been the first perfect score ever in the Rump Roast. So thank you for coming on. And uh, we'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, my pleasure, Jared. If you want to find out more about Jeff Lance and Esquire Interactive, visit EsquireInteractive.com. That's Esquire like lawyer and interactive, EsquireInteractive.com. Now, for those of you listening in Surprise, Arizona, I've got a real surprise for you. And it's on Spotify. Our playlist this week piggybacks off the name game we just played with Jeff. It's songs about specific individuals, real or imagined. Check it out. And because I don't really want to see Evan's balls, trust me, I don't, I'll be watching the new episode of Moon Knight solo tonight. That'll do it for another episode of the Legal Toolkit Podcast. This is Jared Creer reminding you that Cat Stevens' real name is Stephen Katz. Actually, only the first part of that is true. And my real name is... Well, it's Jared Korea. I don't use a pseudonym. But if I did, it would be Ron Mexico.
Unbillable Hour podcast is devoted to all aspects of managing your law practice outside of your client responsibilities. I am Christopher T. Anderson, a lawyer and the host of the podcast. In each episode, I invite industry professionals to discuss best practices for marketing, time management, client acquisition, and everything in between. For actionable and practical information to refine your practice, turn to the Unbillable Hour on the Legal Talk Network.